Hey, everybody. Let's uh, give a few minutes for some more people to jump on here so they can catch this live. Um, so my lives are pretty random. I decide to do that because uh, every now and then it will occur to me that, hey, this is a great piece of information. I should probably um, get this out and, you know, uh, let people know how how this ties in. So if you notice a lot of my videos, I'm just trying to make, keep clarifying and clarifying and clarifying so that people can really get a grasp of the overall picture and how to manage their affairs and come to the age of majority because the age of majority is not just a number. Okay. Um, I still have to look for it, but I know it's in the code of federal regulations. Uh, the age of majority is when a person above the age of 18 takes control of their securities. So a minor is someone who is above the age of 18 that has not taken control of their securities. And again, people um, get into the whole, well, we're minors and wards and all that, which is true. I'm not arguing that. Um, it, but there's a there's also the jurisdictional aspect of that. So I'd like to get into a little bit of that uh, just real quick. I was actually texting a friend of mine and um, I wanted to explain to him what legal fiction was. And uh, it was interesting because, again, I found this great piece of just clear cut information. And I'm like, oh, this is this perfectly fits everything that uh, people are trying to figure out. So unfortunately, I don't have screen share option on here or I would screen share. But I recommend that anyone watching this video that wants to know about legal fiction, I highly recommend, number one, I always recommend definitions, but look up a Cornell Law definition of legal fiction. You want to go on and, and find it on Cornell Law. So if you just type in legal fiction, Cornell Law, it, it'll come up and it's very telling, extremely telling. Uh, so I'll read this real fast and then I will uh, explain a little further. So it says legal fiction is an assumption and acceptance of something as fact by a court, although it may not be. So in other words, they can accept a lie, right? A fiction. Uh, so as to allow a rule to operate or be applied in a manner that differs from its original purpose while leaving the letter of the law unchanged. So they can apply a rule in any way, okay, that differs from its original purpose while still covering their ass in the law. How convenient, right? A legal fiction is created typically to achieve such varied aims as convenience, not our convenience, obviously, consistency, equity, that's a big one, or justice, okay? Equity is what we're, our ears peak up with big time. Okay, so that's all well and good, you know, very explanatory. We kind of know that. But the next paragraph, the example here was like, oh, yeah, this is right where it's at. So it says, for example, when a court cannot exercise in personam jurisdiction over a defendant, meaning they can't exercise jurisdiction in, in the person, right? The natural person, the living person, the living man, whatever you want to call it. It can bring that defendant under its jurisdiction via quasi in rem subtype two jurisdiction. I got to tell you, I've been doing this 12 years and I never heard of subtype two jurisdiction. I've definitely heard of quasi in rem, uh, in personam and in rem, in rem meaning in the property, but I never heard subtype two. So that was interesting. So it says the latter, the subtype two, quasi in rem subtype two, is a form of personal jurisdiction, right? So the, so it's a fiction because they're in it, it's in per, they're saying it's personal, it's in personam, even though it's really not. That uses a defendant's property to satisfy a claim against them. So it uses a defendant's own property to satisfy a claim against them, and is a legal fiction because it treats the owner of the property as a defendant, although the subject of the suit is technically the property itself, okay? So, of course, I said, well, I want to go to quasi in rem subtype two. 
Um, so the first thing it says, of course, is when hearing quasi. So I looked that up under court. They, you can actually just click on the link in Cornell Law under that definition. And it'll come right up. Um, when hearing quasi in rem actions, a court may only affect a named defendant's interest in a specific named piece of property. All right. So these actions have similarities with both in rem and in personam actions. So again, when hearing quasi in rem actions, a court may only affect a named defendant's interest in a specific named piece of property. Well, what's the interest in what property? The interest in the securities, right? The certificated security, the interest. They can only affect that. That's why it's so powerful when people are going in there and they're not allowing the attachment of the name Right. By saying, you know, my name is John Henry, the house of Doe or however you might say it, family Doe or, um, you know, I'm not the person type of thing. They're not they can't get jurisdiction because they can't attach you to the property. That's what they're doing. This explains it so well. I'm like, this is so perfect, man, how, how this is explained. So and I wanted to share. So that's why we're here. Uh, these actions, okay, so let's go back over that. When hearing quasi in rem actions, a court may only affect a named defendant's interest in a specific named piece of property. These actions have similarities with both in rem and in personam actions. As is the case with in rem actions, a court may hear a quasi in rem action if the named property is within the court's jurisdiction which it is, right, when there's a certificate of, and it's in the states and you're in a county court, which makes it a lot better, too, in the United States if you're in a federal court because the certificate doesn't show that the, the property is in the United States. It shows that it's in a state. The United States only exists in the 10-mile in the square. Um, so let's go back to the beginning of that sentence. As is the case with in rem actions, a court may hear a quasi in rem action if the named property is within the court's jurisdiction, even if the court does not have the power to exercise in personam jurisdiction over the defendant. All right. This is why they try to lock you in to that jurisdiction by asking you questions to tie you to the property to take that in rem jurisdiction so they can take uh, jurisdiction over your person in personam. However, a court acting quasi in rem may only affect the interests of a single named defendant, as is the case in an in personam action. OK, so in other words, they can't uh, it can't name a bunch of defendants under one piece of um property, so to speak, or, or under one quasi in, in rem jurisdiction. There are two types of quasi in rem actions. In a quasi in rem site subtype one action, a plaintiff may sue to enforce a pre-existing interest in the named property. For example, a lender might use a quasi in rem subtype one action to foreclose a mortgage. All right. Now that's subtype one. The state can't sue subtype one because they would have to prove their interest in the property, right? It's basically what that just said. So a lender is going to go, well, I can prove my interest in the, in the property because I've got the note and or the copy of the note. We know how they do all that kind of stuff, right? So that would be subtype one quasi in rem is how the court is taking jurisdiction over you in a mortgage case. I mean, they just said it right there. Quasi in rem subtype two action is more complicated. In this act type of action, a plaintiff may sue to apply the named property to satisfy his or her claim against the property's owner where the plaintiff's claim is unrelated to the property. That sounds like our state actions, right? So now we just heard how they get us into the mortgage action. Now we hear how they get us into the state action. OK, or lawsuit, if you will. Another word for action. This type of action is technically against the named property, not the property's owner. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Thus, the outcome of the case is final regarding the plaintiff's claim against the named property and does not affect the plaintiff's future claim against other pieces of property or the property's actual owner. OK. So the outcome of the case is final regarding the plaintiff's claim. So 
if you shut them down, in other words, they have to start another case if they were going to pursue the same issue, right? Res judicata, basically. Um, for example, an American plaintiff injured by a reckless driver while vacationing in a foreign country might use a quasi in rem subtype two to recover from the driver if American courts could not obtain personal jurisdiction over him. Just an example, but it still fits. Courts may not exercise quasi in rem subtype two jurisdiction where it would be unreasonable to do so. So this is it, man. I mean, this is basically uh, how they're, you know, taking their jurisdiction over you and why when you go in there, it's very important not to allow them to create that connection between you and the property. It's also super important why we are trying to help people understand how to take interest in the property. Once you have that bona fide interest in the property, okay, or that that substantial claim on that property, and you can show the interest as recorded in the county, which is why you'll see myself, guys like Divergent 5, KL, you know, like we, we talk about your public record is super important. When you take interest in that property and you have uh, the superior claim, which is what people call a UCC1, a UCC1 is not a lien for people who are new to the UCC SPC thing. It's not a lien. You have to have a uh, security agreement. You have to have interest in the property. However, a UCC one is just a notice of interest. That's all it is. It's a notice period. It's not a lien. Okay. It's a notice of lien. Just like when the IRS puts a notice of lien in the county court for taxes, that's just a notice of lien. That's not the lien. The lien is the security agreement. The lien is the, ag the agreement that I'm going to give you collateral in return for a loan. So that's the lien. The lender has the lien on my property because I agreed to give him the interest in the property. Well, when we do this in the county record, you don't need a UCC one for your straw man. You can do it in the county record and it's just as effective in equity. Okay. So uh, an interest recorded in the county, in the county, or even an interest, a notice of interest, number one, you have an agreement and you put a notice, you could put a notice of interest in the newspaper. You could put a notice of interest in the county. It's the same thing as a UCC one and has just as much power and effect. Okay. It's just a notice of interest. So once that notice of interest is uh, perfected and, and you've accepted the gift, the, the certificated security, the entity that was given to you at birth, that was created at birth, and then you never you failed to perfect it, you failed to accept it. Once that's done and you have that perfected interest, it's harder for them to take quasi in rem subtype two jurisdiction because you've got the interest, right? The record of interest right here, along with the security certificate itself. So that's really dangerous for them because now they don't have any fictional way to take jurisdiction over you, only the property. And that's what's so important in terms of these uh, court cases and these court hearings. OK, however, you can give them jurisdiction right away and now you're screwed. Because you get, well, how am I going to show interest in this property now? You, then you got to hurry up and try to backstep if you lock yourself into that jurisdiction by answering the questions wrong or whatever these little gatekeepers games are that they try to play. So that's why we say, you know, we never give information. We don't give a name. You know, uh, we don't sign anything because we're not giving any jurisdiction over. So it's really, really important to withhold that card, right? Because you don't want them to have that jurisdiction card. Uh, if, if it's one of these, you know, bull crap, uh, cases. Okay. So the securities are really, really important. Like I said, there is a, um, yeah. So somebody put, let me read this real quick that, uh, Jacob Daniel put in the, in the chat here. Uh, the term minor is also used to refer to an individual who has attained the age of 18 years, but has not yet taken control of the securities contained in his or her minor account. OK, so that's it right there. So you're taking control of those securities, OK, by doing your by having your interest. Then from there, you can notify Secretary of State, you can notify whoever you feel you need to notify the securities intermediary, which would be the Federal Reserve. The Treasury is, is another securities intermediary. The court is a securities intermediary. If they're creating an account and they have your name on it, 
right? Your name is on the account. Just read the definition of securities intermediary under UCC 8102, the definitions. It'll tell you what securities intermediary is. Okay. So 31 CFR 363.6. Thank you, Jacob. I appreciate that. Um, that is uh, telling you right there, you know, that you, the reason you're a minor is because you haven't taken care of those securities. So that's, that's the game, man. I mean, you know, take care of their securities. That's why when I wrote my declaration of status, I made sure I had power of attorney, right, which gave me the authority to act. Then I was very thorough and it's got 80 points in it. And then I turn around and uh, I also claim, I so I claim my interest in it and I show in my declaration of status why I have interest because I've funded this thing, because I have over 21, I like to use over 21 silver dollars uh, in it, for to for um, solvency that I have funded this thing, okay, or can fund this thing, and therefore I have interest in it, and this thing owes me all of its collateral for that. So I have in my declaration of status the actual, if you will, security agreement. Now let's not get confused with investment security agreements. So when you see people doing security agreement for um, the UCC stuff, okay, and it says security agreement real big on it and all. That's for investment securities. Investment securities that are registered securities and stuff, yes, you have to have the word security agreement and you have to go through certain protocol for the security agreement. These are not investment securities. These are public securities, okay, meaning the public owns them at first or issues them, I should say. Um, but they're not investment securities. So for me to take an interest in it, I don't have to go through a uh, investment like a, a security agreement drawn under the UCC because that's for investment securities people that are getting into the trade game all right I'm not doing that so I can take interest in it in one simple paragraph in my DOS okay and then what I do is I do my acceptance and acknowledgement of the certificate then I do my notice of interest based on that paragraph I also appoint myself general executor so I'm exonerated from the, the claim and I can enter the court as a general executor with power of attorney if I want to. And then I have my, I always do a notice of adverse claim, which your adverse claim you can do to any individual that or person that is, uh, you know, trying to attack you based on that minor status. You can then do your adverse claim and say, hey, I've, I've got an adverse claim here. Well, my thinking was if it's already recorded in the county, it's already done. All you do is just, here you go, bam, here you go, adverse claim. You gotta, you're going to step up and say you got a priority claim in this because you can't have a priority interest because I'm the only one on record with a priority interest unless you could pull one out somewhere. Is it in the newspaper somewhere? Is it in a court? Is it in a UCC? Show me someone's priority interest in this thing. Show me the United States priority interest in this thing. If you can't, then you got no claim. I'm first in line, first in time. So that's why my DOS and POA is so thorough because it's, I mean, it says everything that at least I tried to think of everything it, that it needed to be said. And for those people that are interested in my template, purchasing my template, you're more than welcome to. You can add, delete, whatever you want to it, but it's thorough. There's like 80 points in it. Unless you're not married and you don't have children, it cuts it down to, I don't know, like 60, 50, 60 points, something like that. But it's really thorough and the exhibits are really solid. And the reason I use a power of attorney, not the only reason, but one of the reasons I use a power of attorney is because it is a vehicle to get the declaration of status recorded because most counties, county uh, land records, land deeds, they won't record um, any other documents other than the ones that they are statutorily authorized to record. And just about, excuse me, every county land records is authorized to record a power of attorney. So the power of attorney not only gives me the, you know, power to speak on this thing's behalf or, you know, do certain uh, legal maneuvers with it, if you will. It also, uh, uh, excuse me, provides a vehicle to get that recorded into the county. So that's why I use that setup the way that I do. All right. So from there, you know, the world is your oyster. I mean, you notice people, you got to think about who you are in the mix of the entire thing as the securities holder, right? As the securities entitlement holder, look that definition up. 
that's another thing. Go to UCC 8-102 or uh, yeah, 8-102. That's the definitions for securities. Again, though, keep in mind investment securities. However, equity is all through the Uniform Commercial Code. So when you read the definitions, you're not so much concerned about it in terms of investment securities. You're just trying to get the essence of what these terms mean in relation to securities. Because even though the UCC is for investment securities, it is still the essence of the words are still applicable to this public security. So I go to the UCC article, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, Article 8, uh, Section 102, and I look at the definitions to understand who the players are in this whole game. I'm like, oh, well, bam, it says right there, securities intermediary is a bank or, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's a bank, it's, it's someone that has an account, a securities account with your name on it, essentially. And then it says, basically, it's the Federal Reserve, right? That's one. The Treasury would be another. The court would be another. Anybody dealing with this securities that's opening an account, which a court case is an account, they're, they're an intermediary at that point, okay? So you look at the definitions and you can put yourself into the working position of the business. That's why I like to call it the business. This is just business. Now I can see who I am in the business, right, by looking at these definitions. So... Now, that's in terms of your securities. There's other parts of the business, right? The thing, the thing is not alive. It's a decedent. I'm a general executor. I can do the general executor business over the whole thing. That's another section of law, which would be estate and, and wills, right, and trust law. Um, so then you, get, then you get into trust law, okay? Now, a lot of people talk about the estate, the estate, the estate. I always talk about the estate too. The estate, the definition of estate, if you boil it down simply – uh, because, you know, you'll look at the definition of a state and some definitions are like miles long. And I always like to say that's how they camouflage the simplicity of the law is they, you know, how do you camouflage something as simple? You have to hide it. You know, it's like the books behind me. You know, there may be one simple book that I need in that whole thing. Let's let's just say this for conversation. But I would camouflage it by putting all the other books around it with all this other stuff and you never know what's in there. And truthfully, that's how the whole damn thing's written. And I'm always, you know, picking through it to find out where the, the nuggets are. So um, they camouflage the definition of a state. The definition of a state at the end of the day is the sum of all property. That's really the definition of a state. So when we talk about the trust, the SESTA key V and all this, you know, SESTA key V simply means beneficiary. Just look up the definition. And yes, we can go all day long about the esotericism of the 1666 SESTA key V. We don't need that. We just need to understand what a SESTA key V is. It's a beneficiary. Once you know that, forget the word SESTA key V. You don't even need to use it because you're talking, when you talk about a trust, there's a beneficiary. That's a SESTA key V trust, right? So the trust or the, the the estate is the property of the trust. It's all the property that's being held by these intermediaries and stuff because it's being in hel held in trust for the real owner, which is you. You're the beneficial interest holder. So it's really the trust estate, meaning the sum of all property of the trust. Your living man property, your estate would be Actually, your children would be part of your estate. Anything that you as a living man own, which is nothing because everything is tied to that uh, number, unless you've got a lodial title to a home and land patent and all that, that's different. But pretty much everything else is tied to that other thing that's held in trust. So it's the trust estate, okay? The trust estate. All the securities are the trust estate. So whenever I write the entity name in a document, it's always all capital John Henry Doe, comma, a state, you know, um, state of New Jersey, uh, you know, file number or, you know, vital statistics, file number, whatever it is on my birth certificate. That's how I always write it out constantly because I'm letting them know I know who this person is and I know who I am. And I and here's my packet, you know, recorded uh, witnessed by the court, of course, you know, certified full faith and credit from the courtist in this. And now I'm the beneficiary and the general executor. So I have both the power to appoint someone benefit thereof because a, a beneficiary doesn't really necessarily have 
the power to go around appointing trustees. It's the general executor does if there's no trustee over the trust. Picture it as somebody that died. There's a trust there, right? Somebody dies. I mean, put yourself in a scenario like that. Your family member dies. They've appointed you executor. There's a trust that's been sitting there with, uh, you know, property in it, but the trustees have died maybe, right? So there's no, there's no trustees, but a trust by trust law cannot fail for want of a trustee. So the general executor has the power to then appoint someone over that trust. Same exact setup. It's the same setup that, that, you know, we're doing, it's the same setup that we're doing with these guys. Oh, nobody's taking trusteeship. It's just all this property held in trust. Good. You're the trustee. Let's get some business done today. What are we doing folks? I want to go home, you know? And that's when these guys start shaking in their boots because they know you got them dead to rights, especially if you have a copy of your certificated security with the interest, you know, the, the proof of interest in it. All right. So that's what's really important about the whole kit and caboodle in terms of taking that property back. Now, how you proceed from there, again, is how you do business. And if you're going to do business in equity and you're going to make sure that the equity is even because equity means equal, fair, balanced, you know, God's law, things like that then what do you have to do to keep the equity? You have to notice your brother because your brother may be damaging you. So, you know, the equity is like this, right? And you want to notice him first, start bringing the equity back to balance. And when he then injures you, then you go, okay, now I've got the upper hand in the equity and I can sue on an equity. And guess what? We could take jurisdiction under subtype two, just like they can, you know, I got interest in this property. You know, bring bring in the, the state here. So that's really what's going on. And, and that's why you see some of us guys that are doing this stuff. It's you'll see a lot of different angles that we take, but it's all relative. So people always say, what's the process? What's the process? The process is understanding the mechanism. And the only documents you really ever need are affidavits and notices. I like asseverations, too, because that's uh, me you know, stating the facts with God as my witness. However, affidavits, declarations, which are just as good. You can use a declaration too. Okay. And notices that's really procedurally all you should be using in terms of paper. they are all, I shouldn't say you should do anything. You don't have to do anything. What I use, because there's not much else after that. The record is solid and no one can beat that. No one can overcome that interest. No one can, it, it's over at that point. So then it's just how you do business from that point. That's why I keep saying it's not about fighting. You don't have to fight anything. You just have to show them who's who and that you grew up and became of the age. All right. You're of the age of majority now. You're responsible. And I like to use the age of discretion because the age of discretion means that you've come to the age to be able to do business. Age of majority means you've come to the age to do contract. And take care of your securities account or have taken care of your securities account. So that's uh, really the whole kit and caboodle in a nutshell. And I hope that these videos uh, keep breaking it down and breaking it down so that people really can begin to see how the things put together and how they can move about uh, within it and outside of it at the same time, because that's what's really important. So when these guys come across now and they trespass on your property, you got yourself a lawsuit, if you will, right? But here's the thing. The other thing we have to keep in mind, we know that these guys are scared to death that this is going to come out and they don't want it in the public and they have an oath to protect it in the public from the public above anything else, which is why if you start bringing this stuff up in the courtroom, their basic um, operating procedure is to empty the courtroom, bring you up last, you know, call for a psych eval, all these things. That's their operating procedure to make you look crazy because they don't want this in the public. So if I'm going to sue them, I'm going to, uh, you know, seal the case if I can in, in federal jurisdiction. 
And if not, if it's in county, I'm going to enter, enter this evidence in camera. If I'm going to sue, I'm talking about if I'm suing them, the evidence would be entered in camera. So it's, you know, private because I'm accessing the equity. So anyway, I hope that helps. And uh, when I get another one of these, you know, nuggets that I think will be great for clarification, I will hop back on and do another video because I think that's really, really important, um, you know, that everybody really sees the simplicity in the entire thing and how you keep yourself protected is how you do your business, basically. Um, so uh, Russell Houston, he said there's also separation of powers and need to know basis, plausible deniability. Look, they they do that plausible deniability shit all day long, right? We know that. Um, but for us, I deny everything as well in, in my declarations and my affidavits because I'm not I'm not the you know the plaintiff or I'm not trying to make a claim because I'm not trying to prove it. I'm just telling you I deny it, deny, 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 deny the whole way. Now you prove it. And when you have your proof to the contrary, they're gonna have a tough time, right? Because they can't prove it. So that's why I don't get into any I don't get into constitutional stuff and all that. That's just that's just for the the commoners. That's for the uh, the peasants. You know, kings don't use that shit. So that's where where I roll is with the uh, the higher authority, and all my authority comes from God. So, you know, if there's a judge in the room, he better damn well prove he got his authority from God to be a judge, because God is the only judge. So you need to put up or shut up. <laughs> you know, I will gladly accept your position as a trustee, but I'm sorry. I cannot, it's against my religious beliefs to call you judge, period. <laughs> now, if you want to be honorable, I will gladly grant you the title of your honor, but you got to prove your honor to be honorable first. So, um, Michael Short said, is there a book you suggest that has all this in it? Nope. <laughs> There isn't, man. That's what we've all been putting together all these years. I mean, that's why some of us have been at this for, you know, 12, I'm 12 myself, 10, 15, 20 years. And we're finally getting it boiled down to all the parts in one place, which they're not, you know, there's no book out there for that because that would lead us to our salvation. Right. So, um, absolutely. Oh yeah. Yeah. I get you, Russell. They definitely roll that way with plausible deniability all day long, but that's the thing. They can't deny the record. They can't deny a certificated security from their organization. That's why they freak out when you bring a birth certificate into the courtroom. You know, talk to people that have done it. They'll tell you the reaction of the judges. They freak out because they know, shit, I'm busted and I'm busted in the wide open. And what am I going to do here? You know, they can't deny. They've given you the undeniable proof. So they now the most of the attorneys don't know this stuff. So, um, you know, they they just don't they don't grasp it. There's a lot of prosecutors that do know this stuff. OK, um, especially on the federal level. I was helping a guy, um, you know, just talking to him, give him some information. He was going through bankruptcy. He knew nothing, nothing, nothing about the um, straw man, anything. He was just a trainer at a gym, really nice guy, but he's going through bankruptcy. He's petrified. He's never been in court before. And I mean, it was tiny, tiny bits of money they were talking about. But he said, well, here's what my attorney wants me, federal attorney wants me to uh, put into the, to the bankruptcy. And it was an affidavit. I said, you do realize you're swearing to this, right? He's like, well, what do you mean? So I'd explain to him that, you know, that's not the attorney swearing to that. That's you because only you can write the affidavit. He just wrote it for you. And in there, there was one line that said, and I'm paraphrasing, I forget exactly what it said, but it basically said if he uh, were to damage the estate in any way that he agrees to pay the estate, right, out of some fund or whatever. And I said, dude, they're using the word estate in there, okay? This, they use you here, I agree to pay the estate. What estate? What, you're gonna pay your own estate? I said, you asked that attorney what estate he's talking about. So he did. I don't understand this line. What estate are you talking about? The attorney just issued him a new affidavit. Said, oh, we made some corrections and they took that completely out of there. 
So somehow they were going to put him in a bind so that they could suck money out of the estate. And when we called their card on it, they took it right out of there. So these guys know, you know, these guys know big time. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Russell said, just like when you bring up their oath. Yeah, some of them shake at that. Some of, I've seen some of them that they just blow it right off. Like they don't even care of it. But that doesn't even matter at that point. It doesn't even because when you're in equity, that they got no jurisdiction. And when you are talking about trusts and ministerial or um, estates and stuff, there's ministerial duty there. It's not judicial anymore. That's what I keep trying to tell people too. Look it up. Look up what a judicial uh, duty, what a ministerial duty is. When there's a trust involved, there's a ministerial duty of the players in the trust. In other words, they can't arbitrarily make decisions. They can't just do what they want. They have to follow the trust law and the trust principles. So if you're appointing someone a trust in, in a a trust because when you go into court, they're forming the quasi tr the trust, the constructive trust, right? They want you to take that trustee position as the defendant. So you, you block them right away by, you know, well, I'm not the defendant, number one. And then you throw out that I'm the beneficiary. Now you just locked up the constructive trust where you're the beneficiary. And now it becomes a real trust when you say, hey, Mr. Prosecutor, you're the trustee. And I'm the beneficiary. Now there's a ministerial duty for the judge, not a judicial duty going on. All right. So you lock them into the equity. That's what's important. And yeah, the exclusive equity. I, I will say that I don't believe in the term exclusive equity because what they're trying to do is get you into at law. So, yes, I do believe that everything should be handled in equity because that's where it starts. So it is equity, yes. However, if you trip up, they're going to throw you into at law and that's when you're going to get screwed. And it's no longer exclusive equity anymore. Now you're dealing now you got to figure out how to maneuver through that. So, I do believe in the equity is the most powerful thing, absolutely. So um yeah, man, that's what it's that's what's up. That's what it's all about. So if you can wrap your head around this stuff and the, the entire mechanism of it all, your your main points are. And this is why I don't just I call it a declaration of status, but it's a declaration of status, property and obligation. That is the three departments of civil law. OK, status, property, obligation. If you're not taking care of one of those, your table, your leg, the leg of your table is missing. It falls over. So I like to look at it as a table with three legs, you know, three departments, civil law. If I'm missing one of those, my table falls over, which is why just the declaration, just about freaking everything that you guys do, you know, all the way through. Now I have the upper hand, right, because. I've taken care of that. I've shown that I'm responsible. I've come of age. I've done all done all your little, you know, jump through all your hoops in one fell swoop. So when we're learning this stuff, we want to think about the property, the obligation and the status, not just the status, not just focusing on I'm a living man. I'm a living man. I'm a living man. No, no, no. You also have property attached to that thing and an obligation. So you want to correct all that. And once you understand in your mind how you've corrected all that, remember, all property belongs to the organization that the state owns by the obligation you created. Well, your parents created at birth and you never reorganized, uh, so to speak, or uh, you never corrected the obligation. So all property is everything attached to that social security number and that, that straw man, right? And the obligation is when you're registered at birth. The status is first. You can't even you can't even address this stuff without status being correct. So, you know, um, yeah, I mean, these guys, I get it, man. I same thing. I mean, these guys will run off the bench at this stuff, man. They will run off the bench at this stuff a lot of times. But I learned that that's not really the way because that's not getting me where I need to go either. I'm not trying to make the guy run off the bench. I'm making him do his job. So if I can, so that's why, so let me back up with this too. That's also why personally I do everything behind the scenes before that court appearance even happens. Everybody gets notified. So now I can go in there and speak the secret language with the judge. As long as I'm listening to what he's saying and not getting all emotional, you're, you're going to take my rights. You know, no, if he says something that I don't like, 
it's probably he's giving me a clue to what I need to do. That's what we've recognized in so many cases that we've worked on. And the people would report back, man, he said this or he said that and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, dude, he was telling you, didn't you hear what he said? Listen to what he said. He was totally telling you this is what we need to do. And, and these people were down thinking they screwed up. I'm like, you didn't screw up. He was telling you what to do. So let's do that. And we would do it. And bam, done, you know, but everything was done behind the scenes. So the court banter was minimal. It, all my guy had to stick to was the fact that he's not the defendant. He's the general executor, just here to settle the matter, accept all the charges on behalf of the estate. That's all been done. Everybody's been notified. We good, Right. And then the judge would ask about well, prosecutor, do you have any, you know, do you have any questions? The prosecutor, well, you know, is this yours? Is that yours? You know, are you? No, 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 no. It all belongs to the estate. That's the estate. No, it's not me. No, it's not me. Deny, deny, deny. Oh, uh, sorry, Your Honor. We have no further questions and we no longer prosecute. Done deal. Thank you. Everybody have a nice day. Go home. Everything's quiet, right? So, um, you know, let me read some of these comments. Do you have to ask for Article 3 when handing the birth? I don't have to ask for shit. I'm the king. I don't have to ask for anything. I that's the, See, that's the difference, too, with me and a lot of – I don't at, I do not go in there as if they have some sort of authority. Oh, let me ask you, are you a specific court? Hell no. You know, court? No. <laughs> I'm the one in control. This is my court. So if you go back to common law – or, or international law, what does it say about the word court in Black's Law 4th, if you've ever read that? Black's Law 4th says court in international law, all right? Court in international law is a person in suit of the sovereign. That is my court. That's not your court. And I don't have to as king shit. I am the king. This is how it's going to go down. I've already done everything. I'm here in honor, in peace, Complete honor, completely knowledgeable. We don't need to do this. I'm not here to fight with you, so I don't need your court. It's not your court anyway. And so that's how I, that's the energy that I carry when I go in. I'm not worried about any of that shit. I'm just making sure you're not attaching me to the defendant because I have all the proof in the pudding to show the defendant's right here and I've got the security for it and I've got all the property on lockdown. So Good luck with that. I don't need to bring up any of this stuff, you know. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, Nathaniel said the bankruptcy is huge because a debtor cannot bring a valid claim against a true creditor. There you go. That's the other thing that your record does if you do it correctly. Uh, the DOS, the POA or POA DOS, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I become the creditor again. Here I'm the creditor. I've credited your organization by having an amount in silver in my pocket, which is why they took all the gold and silver back in 33, right? So that they could create debtors out of everybody. Then they let them have it back because they're like, they don't know how to become creditors. They can have it back, not a problem, right? So, yeah. So um, if the information's been good, yes, thank you, Judy. Smash that uh, thumbs up for me. Um, I definitely want more and more people to you know, see this information or hear this information, because what I've noticed over the 12 years is what you guys notice. There's so much scattered information. There's so much misinformation. There's so many people focused on one symptom, but not the whole picture, right? Everybody's trying to attack the symptoms, right? But the big picture that I always saw in my mind was, I need to yank this thing out from the root. When you when you go weeding your garden, you pull it out from the root so the weed doesn't grow back, right? Not the weed you smoke. <laughs> That's different. Um, so you you know you yank that weed out from the root. So what is the root? The root is. So that's in my mind years ago when I started looking at this, I went, OK, I have to go back to the moment I popped out of the womb. And what was the transaction that took place? Then it took me all those years to figure out all the pieces. And, you know, yes, I've been through all of it, the maritime stuff, you know, the, all the different words of the birth and, you know, all the esoteric stuff, which is all relevant. The problem is a lot of that stuff really gets you sidetracked. You have to stay focused. 
it's kind of like when I had a Facebook page, I only wanted to focus on trusts and stuff and this, and everybody would come in there with all this cabal shit and look at what they're doing. And I would just bam, bam, shut them down. They'd get pissed off. Oh, you're like a dictator. No, it's my room. And the focus has to stay here. The reason I had that page was to put information out that was focused. You're coming in with all this garbage and you're throwing the focus off. People are going all over the place, you know, no, you got to stay focused. So hopefully that's what I'm doing for you guys is bringing the focus on the very pertinent pieces, which it still behooves you to study because I can't do it for you. Uh, but the very pertinent pieces for you to study. So you're not going all over these rabbit trails. But I like to look at the rabbit trails as a peripheral study that is good to know because it gives you a lot of depth and background into what you're doing. But in actual application, there's few things that have to be done to apply this in a simple way for every situation. Every situation is the same. If they're dealing with that straw man, it is not about the charges. It's not about you going in there and fighting for your right to travel. It's not about any of that. It's about the property, obligations, and status, period, on every single situation. Okay, this is a civil law court system. That's why they, that's in 1938 is why they blended the uh, common law or at law and equity into one form of action, the civil action. That's why you have the civil rules of procedure. Okay, because everything is under the civil umbrella. So definitely look always, always, always to the three pillars the obligations, the property, and the status in every single situation that occurs, okay? And you look at yourself in relation to those three because that's what sinks or keeps your ship afloat is your relationship, right, to any of those three because they only have control in the civil law over those three with a piece of public property, which is your straw man and all the property attached to it and the obligation that was created to the state as the debtor. So again, property, obligation, status. Just look up law of property, law of status, law of obligation in Black's Law, the seventh edition. It's not in the earlier editions. And it says that they are under each definition, one of the three departments of civil law also see Law of status, law of obligation. Then you look those up, says the same thing. Also see law of property, law of obligation, right? When you're looking up law of status. So those are the three, man. Very, very important. Yes, civil is Roman, which is where I go to then the higher law of God. Because where did Rome come from, right? The Vatican, okay? Where did Rome, I should say, where did Rome go? into the Vatican, right? The Roman Catholic Church, who created equity or who brought in equity law? The bishops did at the time, okay? The bishops brought in the equity law. So under the Vatican, who's the top trustee of that system? The Pope, right? Plug my charger in here. Things are getting a little bit low since I'm running video. Here. All right. The Roman Empire never died. That's right, Nathaniel. And that's I've said that for years. It just went underground. Right. It just went. It, it just hid, and it morphed itself into all these, all these systems. You know, were created off it. Um, are there steps we should take to make ourselves a creditor, or is that just for when we have to go to court for something? Um, don't be sorry, brother, if you're if you're brand new. There's a lot of brand newbies. To make yourself the creditor, I explained it earlier. It's not hard. You have to have an interest. You have to have a right to the property. You have to have an interest. That comes in your declaration of status, property, and obligation where you say, hey, I'm solvent with $21 in silver, and I pledge this over to John Henry Doe, comma, estate, blah, 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 blah. Done deal. You're the creditor. It's over at that point, as long as you have public record of it. Now, public record 
with that is, yes, it's a public notice, but it's a constructive notice. So it's not constructive notice is not uh, actual. OK, um, actual is when you take that notice and you forward it and directly send it to someone. So we we want a general public notice of this and then we want to do our actual notices when we're ready. And that's why we say to people, you know, your notice is your equity. You want to beat these guys to the punch. Make sure they're notified before anything. Secretary of State of the United States, president, if you want. That's, these guys aren't going to read it. That's fine. It doesn't matter. What matters is you have a record that you legally served them via registered or certified mail to those offices. So they're technically notified. OK, so notice to principals, notice to agents. So if you notified the president who's at the top, notice to principal all the way down to all the agents are notified, you know, and when I do it, I look for their legal advisors. I don't just send it to that office. I send it to the legal advisor who would be the attorney general. Uh, but there are specific attorney generals for each office. Like there's one for the secretary of state. There's one for the president, which is the main attorney general. That's the president's attorney. Uh, the uh, secretary of state has has an attorney assigned to him or her. So, you know, they, they're the ones that receive the legal service of process for their organization. So I always notify them. I put, you know, um, on the on the paperwork, it will be the office of uh, secretary of state uh, care of legal, you know, so-and-so legal advisor. Okay. That way they're properly notified. Now, any action that happens after that against me, wait a minute, let's pull out the notice here. You guys have already been given notification. So I don't really understand what you think you're trying to do, but what you think you're trying to do is not what you have a legal right to do. Equity's done, right? So you got to set yourself up with an offense. Strategy, strategy, strategy. That's another thing. People, you know, I've noticed over the course of these years, people just, you know, they start throwing shit. <sighs> they just start throwing shit. They have no strategy. Well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to send them my bill and I'm going to, you know, do my UCC. And the next thing you know, these people on the other side have received so much shit from you that they're like, you don't know what the hell you're doing. So all this stuff that people are throwing at these guys lets them know you have no clue what you're doing. So strategy, 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 offense, offense, offense. That way, when it comes time for your defense, you're solid, man. You are solid. So got to, got to, got to, got to, got to take care of this stuff first. And yes, Nathaniel says, uh, a legal maxim, which means you can have it both ways, or you, you can have it both ways, which is why status is so important. Inclusio unius es exclusio alteris. Alteris. I'm not good at Latin, but I definitely am familiar with that maxim. And I know, I know he did mean can. I was going to say, actually, it means it's a legal maxim, which means you can't have it both ways. Um, so, yes, you can't. And that's why your status is super important. Um, so, you know, yeah, your, your offense, man, it's super important. You got to have your offense. That's it. It's the end game after that. You're already set up, but people don't think like that. They wait till they get into a legal situation and then they run and they, now they're trying to defend. You don't have an offense. And the minute you take up a defense, you just admit it to the jurisdiction because you're defending on behalf of this organization that you have no right to do. You have no status with you. You can't. So you can't, you know, you got to have your strategy down, man. It's super important. Strategy, strategy, strategy. So anyhow, I think that'll do it. I try to keep these short, but this one went way long, which is all good. I appreciate everybody's participation and views. Um, thank you. You guys are great. Y'all know, you know what you're doing. A lot of you, some of you guys that are new, you'll learn what you're doing. Hopefully we can whittle this down so you're not, you new guys aren't running all over the place trying to chase all these guru, you know, theories. Um, definitely, you know, if you're new, uh, study what trusts are, equity law, the maxims of equity, you know, make sure you're always, always, always looking 
at the definitions of everything, legal definitions, super important, jurisdiction, status, obligation, property, securities, those types of subjects. And, and don't listen to what everybody's telling you. R go into those subjects and actually study them. And the way that I study, which may help you guys, is whenever I look, like even when I'm in American jurisprudence and all, you know, all those books, I'm in there all the time looking at stuff. But what I'm looking for is how does, when I read it, I put myself in the position of what the context is in terms of how does this apply to me and the organization and the government or someone else, you know, like a bank or something? How, it, when I'm reading this, I'm putting myself in the scenario and I go, okay, does this apply? And if it does apply, how am I going to tie it together so that I can prove that it applies without even having to hardly even say it? Like we're just making it obvious. So that's how I study. I always study and look for how does this fit? I try my best not to study on implication, right? And what's implied. I try to make sure I find it concrete so that I feel confident that I could back this right up. Bam, bam, bam. Because I found the concrete connection on how to make this leak. Cause everything's legal theory, how to make this legal theory solid. All right. So that's how I study. So that might help some of you new guys. Always put yourself, the straw man, know the arrangement, who the government is, who the straw man is, who you are, right? Government's trustees, you know, straw man is the property and, and is a beneficiary, believe it or not. And then you're the beneficiary of all that trust property because you took possession or you took uh, interest, uh, priority interest over the straw man. So you put that mechanism, you constantly look at that triangle of how it works and you can put yourself in the study in the scenario and things make a lot more sense, you know? So anyway, all right, brothers and sisters, I will check you all out next time. Everybody have a great rest of your weekend. I got tons and tons of work to do. See y'all.